No, I, I haven't. I'm going to call the workshop to order. Uh, the first thing I'm going to just before we start, if everyone could make sure their phones are off, I would really appreciate it. Um, this is the um, workshop for Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. It's a little bit after six. I apologize for the late start. This meeting will be conducted in person in the Sanford City Council Chambers and via remote video and teleconference pursuant to 1 MRSA Section 403B2D and Section 6 of the Sanford City Council Rules or Procedure as amended and adopted May 3, 2022. Members of the public may join the meeting by phone by dialing 1-929-205-6099 using meeting ID 881-4494-5839 and password 912-716 or via computer at the link provided on the City's website. This is a work session of the Sanford City Council and not a business meeting of the City Council. Meeting is open to the public, but is not a public hearing. Chairperson shall conduct the work session with the committee members and may elect to call upon the public in attendance for either questions or to obtain input and information. And I can tell you that we will be asking for questions and allowing public input of any type, as long as it's respectful at this meeting. So I appreciate that. And all work products will be developed by consensus and forwarded as advisory to the full council for any matter warranting legislative action by the City Council at a business meeting so posted and assembled. I um, will we'll start with, um, I'll, I'll just, the, the, the item is 22-444-01, City Council Workshop, the Continuum of Housing. I am um, Anne-Marie Mastracchio, the Mayor of the City of Sanford, and I want to welcome everyone both here and at home who are watching. Um, I will um, be co-chairing this meeting with Diane Gary, the Sanford Housing Authority Do Executive Director, and um, I think the first order of business will be that um, we will ask for introductions. So why don't we start with the city manager and go around the table, and if everyone knows, just if you turn your, phone, your mic on, just make sure you turn it off, they're very sensitive. Um, I would appreciate if people in the back, if you cannot hear us, just let me know, because I know they work fine for at home, but they may not in this building with these high ceilings, sometimes you can't hear us. Good evening, Stephen Buck, city manager. I'm very excited to uh, learn more and, and see the coordination here this evening, so thank you. Steve Boozer, the assistant superintendent for the Sanford School Department. I'm Officer Colleen Adams with the Sanford Police Department representing the mental health unit. Carter Friend, executive director of York County Community Action. Bonnie Gagnon, Director of Residential Services at Caring Unlimited. Megan Jean Gendron, Executive Director of York County Shelter Programs. And again, I'm Diane Gary, Executive Director of Sanford Housing Authority. Anne-Marie Mastracchio, Mayor of City of Sanford. Sanford. Moore Herlihy, Sanford City Councilor. Uh, Bob Stackpole, City Council. Becky Brink, City Council. Ann Hanselman, also with the City Council, and I apologize for being late, but I'm going to pass around a box of chocolates and encourage you all to take one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Termath, uh, City Council, and yes, I would love to take chocolate. <laughs> See, there is a good benefit to sitting next to the person with the chocolates. She always brings the sweets, John. She Mark. does. Mike, sorry. <laughs> okay, then I'm going, we're going to start, and I'm going to turn it over to Diane. Okay, so here we are to talk about the housing crisis and the solutions, hopefully, that we can all come up with in the future to help solve that. We have a wonderful panel of people to present on resources and how we collaborate and how we also work with the city on coming up with um, resources. So without further ado, I'm going to have Carter Friend speak of the, the context of the meeting. And Carter, just move yours, you're tall, so just move yours up and a little bit closer to you. I just think that, I'm sorry, uh, is that, no, is distracted that good? by the chocolate. Thank so. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I'm Carter Friend. I'm the Executive Director of York County Community Action. And we thought a good place to start would be to talk a little bit about the context for the current affordable housing crisis and some of the causes of that crisis. And so I'm really just going to touch on three areas broadly. Um, and there may be folks here who want to add to that. Um, but uh, the first area, not surprisingly, is the fact that we don't have enough housing units, right? There have not been enough housing units, um, either generally or specifically affordable housing. Um, and um, really what's true is over the past 10 years or so, um, the production of housing units has not kept up with the need. 
Um, and so that has put real pressure on the housing market. Um, that's been very, uh, it's true generally, but it's also been very specifically true of affordable housing, um, where we've not kept up with the need there as well. Um, there are a lot of barriers to uh, building housing, um, specifically with regard to affordable housing. Um, it's very expensive, uh, and so it often requires uh, support to do that, and there's a finite amount of support to do that. Uh, more generally, I think we know a lot of the barriers. There's a real uh, shortage of labor. Um, a lot of the materials are very expensive. Land is very expensive, and there are also constraints around um, land use ordinances and zoning. Um, so really the first set of issues is just that there's a, is a real shortage of housing supply or housing stock. Um, the second uh, set of issues relate to the pressure then that exists on this sort of finite uh, set of housing. And there are really three pressures that, um, that are, worth, I think, worth mentioning. The first is that there's been a significant increase in the number of investors that, investors that have moved into um, the, uh, uh, the single-family home market. And so I think this is, this is a, a national number, but I think it's really interesting to point out. So just a year ago, in 2021, about 19% of, of, of purchases of single family homes were made by uh, investors. And I'm talking about large investors that maybe own 100 units or more. Just a year later, that number was up from 19% to 28%. So investors have really moved into the single family home market. And what's happening is they're buying single family homes, they're then rent, and they're actually buying them at, towards the bottom of the market, the least expensive homes, then they're renovating them, and then they're selling them in the middle and upper ends of the market. So they're really taking out that really affordable end of the market. This is not all investors, right? They're not all investors are doing this, but it's a trend particularly for, for larger investors. Um, a second thing that's putting a lot of pressure on the housing market is actually the growth in the number of households that are moving into purchasing um, housing or renting. Uh, and a lot of that growth is coming from folks that are 25 to 30 years old that have been living at home and are now moving into, in larger numbers than usual, moving into the market at a time when that market already has a lot of pressure on it. Um, so that's just creating even more pressure. Um, and then the, th the third factor really has to do with um, the rental market specifically, and that is if you think about this as a pipeline where folks might initially rent a uh, property, maybe then rent a nicer or larger property, and then move into home ownership, because of the affordable housing crisis, people are not able to move from renting into home ownership, and so that's putting a lot of pressure on the rental market, um, and it's making it much more difficult for folks at the bottom end of that market to be able to, to rent. Um, and what's also true is because rents are higher, that means people who are renting are um, less able to save to ultimately purchase and move into a home. So the second set of issues are all really around the pressure that exists on the existing housing stock. Um, there's a third set of issues, which is really sort of a group of issues that are individually playing out and impacting affordability. The first is the recent increase in um, mortgage rates. Right, so we've seen an increase in mortgage rates. It's gone up 2% or more. And that has a significant impact on p the affordability of housing. And so I have a number here again. So um, a two percentage point hike in the interest rate is the same as a 27% jump in a home price, just in terms of a monthly mortgage payment. So this 2% increase we've seen recently has moved a lot of people out of the housing market because it's no longer affordable for them. The other side of that uh, interest rate um, coin is uh, that's a result of increased inflation. Uh, that's the Fed's effort to try and tame inflation. Um, but what's happened with inflation is you have folks who might have a fixed mortgage or even might be on a fixed rent, but suddenly they've seen all their other costs go up. They've seen their fuel costs go up, their heating costs go up, um, and food and other costs go up. And so if those go up two to $300 a month, then what was affordable housing becomes maybe no longer affordable housing in a really tight situation. The last thing that I think is worth mentioning um, is just uh, senior housing. So um, obviously we're the oldest state in the, in the country, um, and so there are a lot of folks who are living in senior housing where that housing may no longer work for them, that they need to invest in it in order for it to become um, accessible and uh, so they can continue to live in it, and they may not be able to afford to do that. So what was affordable housing, no longer, without that investment, no longer becomes affordable housing because they can't afford to make that investment. So really, um, I guess the, the high level takeaway is that uh, there are not enough, enough units, a lot of pressure on the housing market, and it's an issue that has taken a long time to develop, and so we'll take a long, and a complex issue, and so it's gonna take us a long time to really work our way out of it.
So I'll stop there. I'm sure there are folks in the room who um, are familiar with this as well and may want to add uh, to some of that. You want to, is it okay if I ask if anybody has any questions Absolutely. before we go on? Yep. Anybody in the, on this side of the, or anybody that wants to ask a question? Go ahead, Councillor Ann. No, I, I think you put it well with some of the, the numbers and explaining the issues, but what one thing that resonated with me is I heard that my kids might stay with me until they're 25 or 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, or it's going to cost you to get rid of them. <laughs> no, thank you. Hmm. I think another interesting point is that um, Maine Housing did a study and that in order for us to kind of meet the need of the of everyone kind of getting their own housing is that we need to put 19,000 more units online throughout the state of Maine. And so that might seem overwhelming, but in Sanford and Springvale, we do have movement of, of apartments you know, being built. And, and as those, um, they're not called affordable housing units, right? They're, they're market rate, but they will move that continuum along so that then we can then partner with people to do affordable housing. And they may take some housing vouchers, which would be great. We all partner with that with security deposits and things like that. So I think I don't want people to leave here feeling hopeless, like, oh my gosh, there's this housing crisis and we're never going to get out of it. You know, Someone once said to me that, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time, right? So this is kind of an elephant type problem and we're going to get through it just one, one bite at a time. And if we all work together, it's going to be that much quicker. So. You know, we have to stay the course and keep doing the things that we're doing. I just think that's worth noting. Anybody else have any questions? I don't see any hands. I have one. I, I just was wondering if you had any data about Sanford and that, that figure about the increase in investors in the single family market. I don't. You I don't, don't have any local data on that. Well, they yeah. probably haven't. They've just started to, it, it's a new problem. So we really, we, we hear anecdotally that there are people buying up groups of apartment buildings. And I think that at some point that's going to have to be a figure that we're going to have to look at right. and yeah. see what the effect of that has been. Yeah. I've heard the same thing anecdotally and don't have any, any hard data on that. Is it something that the state is starting to look at? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if any of you all know whether the state's okay. tracking uh, in investment properties. I don't know if the state is, but I know. Mayor Mastracchio? This is the end. <laughs> Is that somebody on Zoom? Oh, Ian. This okay. is Ian Housefield, oh, Director ahead, of Community Ian. Development. Yes, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, we do have local data. We do have local data for um, percentage of investor-owned um, property. Um, it's a little bit difficult to get a definitive tracking right now in the increase in purchases of single family. Uh, but the number, as we presented to the Zoning Committee, I think last March was somewhere in the order of 25 to 30 percent of single family properties owned by uh, properties that were not the owner. Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me, by, by, by non-owner occupant. Did everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. You want to, do you mind? So I think it was 25 to 30 percent owned by non-owner occupied. And that's single family. Single he wasn't family. talking about the multifamilies, which is a whole other investor group. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Diane. And for multifamily, that's something that housing authorities are looking into, as you know, in South Portland. In Portland, you may have heard that some of those buildings were bought by outside investors, too, and they increased the rents, and people had to move out, and it was very kind of um, a difficult time. So one of the things that we're fortunate with at in Sanford is that we own our public housing. We own um, various affordable housing, so that stabilized in our community so there's no fear of I'm not going to sell East Side Acres and Sunset Tower to an outside investor I can promise you that um, and so that's kind of a, a good thing and as well as Megan's properties and your kind of community actions and Caring Unlimited we, we're all committed to keeping affordable housing within our community to help with that continuum of care so we're committed to that and Steve and I have many conversations about um, affordable housing and keeping it in Sanford, so. So can you take it, a, a, take it away from the properties that you own? Because obviously Facebook is full of stories of new investors purchasing um, properties mm -hmm. and the rents going up after a period of time. And what is, so through your voucher program, what kind of impact are you seeing in that regard? So I, I did look up that stat. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of April, we had um, 
41 people come off the housing program, the housing voucher program. Mm -hmm. Some of that was due to um, a land, you know, the lease comes up, the rent goes up, they can't afford it, they won't accept the voucher payment, they have to leave. Mm -hmm. um, probably that's a third mm -hmm. of the people, and then other people came off for other reasons. So it is impacting us. The other part is now that, um, so we were at four, 583 vouchers at one time out on the streets, leased up, and now we're down to 515 vouchers that are leased up with people looking. So it's not, it's a struggle. And it's one of the things that for the housing authority, for our resource, it's difficult because we're directly impacted by this housing market. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we've done to help try to fix that is to increase our payment standards. So no, normally we're at 90%, as you know, fair market mm -hmm. rent. We went up to 110% mm -hmm. to try to be a little more competitive with people. Mm -hmm. We do landlord incentive programs um, to help landlords get, you know, incentivize them to lease up too so that it, we can work with them as well. But it's, it's challenging when, you know, for a one bedroom you can take a housing voucher for 1100 or you can get 1600 you know, uh, yeah. and people will pay it. So between the 515 and the 583, are those people looking? We have 25 have the people. Vouchers. Well, so one of the things we try to do is kind of phase people looking for housing, because you don't want to give all of a sudden 60 mm -hmm. vouchers out gotcha. there and have mm -hmm. that market flooded with people looking, and you mm -hmm. know, it's hard enough to find right. housing for anyone. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we do what we call a pull. So we pull 25 vouchers at a time, and then we monitor how many people, they have 60 to 120 days to, to lease up, and right. then they lose the voucher. So that's another really major consideration that we have to take into account is that we don't want to give someone a voucher and have them have to give it back to us. Mm -hmm. And then they get put back on the bottom of the list. That's, that's tragic. Well, that's, that's not awful. a good story. That's Especially terrible. if it's not their fault, they can't find exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we're trying to work with people to give them the length of time to find a unit, the landlord incentives, increase payment standard and then just some case management of working with people okay. so we'll do that 25 at a time usually within th you know that 120 days we'll evaluate mm -hmm. where people are and then we'll pull down another 25 okay okay who's next oh next we're going to start with um some success stories because we're trying to sandwich this a little bit <laughs> with some positive <laughs> some positive stuff so uh we're going to have megan start with a story we wanted to share these success stories with all of you. We've heard the data. As Diane said, we also want to share some positive <laughs> stories. This is an individual that came into the shelter from Samford, and I'm just going to read you his story um, so that I do not forget any of these important parts. We met Seth after he'd lost everything. Just months before he was working full time at a job that he enjoyed, was paying his bills and enjoying his life when he began suffering from an unknown medical issue that was causing him to miss work. Eventually, he lost his job and his health insurance due to complications from this medical condition and then quickly lost everything, his family, his house, and his independence. That was the day that he was faced with making the most difficult decision of his life and one that he never thought he would face. He made the decision to come into our emergency shelter in Alfred. Within months, he went from feeling like he was on top of the world to feeling like he did not even want to be part of the world any longer. He felt hopeless and afraid. Our staff immediately began working with Seth on addressing his medical issues that were at the root of many of the issues that he was facing. He applied for main care so that he could begin receiving the treatment that he desperately needed. Over the next few months, Seth not only connected with a new PCP, but also started seeing a specialist, and together they got his medical condition under control with medications to help manage his heart condition. As soon as he had a safe roof over his head and was surrounded by people that cared about him, Seth was able to slowly begin putting all of the pieces back together in his life. Now that he was well again, he knew his old job would be there waiting, and it was. He soon received a rental assistance voucher, a housing voucher, and worked with our housing team to find an apartment. Shortly after moving back into his very own place, Seth got his old job back and private insurance that came with that job. He was able to buy a car as well. One year after renting the apartment, utilizing his housing voucher, Seth no longer needed that housing voucher as he was now making enough money to pay his full rent. For the next six months, Seth worked on accomplishing his new dream, to own a home. I'm thrilled to report that Seth now owns a home here in Sanford and remains in touch with the staff that always believed in him even when he did not believe in himself. 
Seth is an extraordinary human being, but this situation is not the exception. So often it starts with one person believing in you and then landing in a safe place where a person can begin putting the pieces back together again. And obviously I did change the name um, for anonymity purposes, but I wanted to share that story with all of you. This is a homeowner in Sanford, one of your neighbors who is just an incredible success story. Homelessness in the school department, um, there's no two stories that are the same. Um, traditionally, we've had families that have suffered domestic violence. Um, we've had families that have had life events, um, loss of employment, um, illnesses that have caused unemployment, that have caused homelessness. Um, one particular family, I will share their story. Um, this was a family that lost housing a couple of years ago. Um, and when they lost housing, their family structure, their supports fell apart. Um, DHS became involved. A sibling was removed from the family. The students started to experience um, behavior in the school setting, um, being unsuccessful. Um, and that's when our outreach worker got involved. Um, the outreach worker became involved, connected with the family, um, worked with mom, um, was able to help mom get into the shelter, through the work of the outreach worker, mom was able to access counseling for herself, able to access counseling for the, the student himself. Um, and with that, there was some substance abuse um, by the student. And so the family really did some hard work in regards to that as well. The good news to all of this is today they have stable housing. The family has been reunited. The student has joined our school system um, once again, and he is flourishing um, at his new placement within our school department. But I think that speaks to, for us, um, the role of outreach, the role of identifying a family, um, the role of working together through multiple agencies um, to really help support and wrap ourselves around the family. And it really took um, a while to get this to happen. But really, um, it's a kudos to the family, for mom, for engaging, and then kudos to the agencies to help support this family. So that's, that's just our success story. I think in the school department, the one thing that we are seeing that's new for us in terms of homelessness is in regards to um, working families losing their home due to the rising cost of rents, um, properties being sold, and then having no place to stay. Um, a lot of times these families are finding um, relatives to stay with, um, and so they're not out on the, out on the street. Um, so that's the good thing. But the, the, the sad piece of it that I've noticed in our office this year is we're getting calls like, we don't have, we don't have stable housing. I'm staying, with, I'm staying with my mom in New Hampshire. What, what can we do to, to have Johnny stay with us in the Sanford School Department? Um, and those are hard situations, hard situations um, with that. And so. Our community members are being forced out um, because of that. So, so that's a good story, and, th and there's sort of some, some new trends that we're seeing in the school department um, as well. Steve, do you find that um, people ask for help like when it's almost too late? Um, or is there a way that, I mean, it seems to me that sometimes we keep thinking everything's going to turn out and that it, if we could intervene a little sooner. Like, you had, like that child acted out and you had to figure out what was going on so, and you probably didn't know about the problem. And I think that that probably is an issue for all of these agencies. So I think of the school department, we're fortunate. We, we have students in front of us that they'll, they'll have signs and symptoms. And so we'll notice, you know, the kid's coming in disheveled or this, the student is exhibiting behavior problems or starts to have attendance issues. And so we notice, hmm, something's up. And so our outreach workers, and when I say outreach workers, we have folks that are assigned to, to do some dig, deep digging, but whether it be an administrator or a teacher or a school counselor, you know, school staff are able to identify, hey, there's an issue, and then our outreach is able to step in and, and, and talk to the family. Um, and most of the time, families are receptive to the support because of the relationships that have been built, built with school staff. They trust us. And so um, I think 
do they come right out to say, hey, I'm losing my housing? Sometimes they do, but more times than not, it's, it's a back door. We notice something's up and then the outreach. I um, mean, we're fortunate. With adults, I don't think necessarily have that, um, know who to turn to. Um, but as a school system, we're in a unique position to be able to reach out to them. Go ahead, Mike. You have a question? Yeah, thank you. It's more of a you know, more of a comment, though. And I, I just wanted to say real quick, you know, thank you to everybody here that's that's doing the hard heavy lifting, right? You know, our kids in schools having the signs and symptoms like Steve spoke about, awesome. Um, but most most common than not, it's uh, when it comes to folks in our community, you know, it's it's a lot of factors, right? It's a lot of factors that involves encompasses you know homelessness encompasses that. And one big factor right now is what, the economy, right? The economy is a huge factor on that. So from what I just wanted to say real quick, from what I've been hearing so far, I'm very, very pleased because, you know, we're not getting into the, you know, to the heavy waters like Portland where we have to do moratoriums on rent stabilization and things like that, you know. So it's good that our community knows that we have, we have a uh, safety net, so to speak. People are in their corner to say, hey, look, we understand what's going on. But most, most importantly, I just wanted to, you know, just throw it out there that if anybody's experiencing trouble, you know, please, you know, reach out, you know, reach out to those departments that they can help because, you know, we are a team, we are a community, right? And, yep. and it starts with, you know, speaking up and saying something, but mostly all of us as human beings, we're prideful, right? Yep, thank you, Mike. Um, we're gonna still be going through all the stuff that is available for people, so who's next? I'll call this mom by the name of Sarah. I changed her name for her safety. Um, she came into shelter and she had four children with her. Uh, she had experienced uh, domestic violence in her home. A protection order came in place, but it wasn't, um, she wasn't able to go back to the home because the home belonged to his family. So um, she needed to be sheltered. Um, she felt like she didn't know where else to go and kept saying, maybe he'll change and I can go back with the children um, there because how am I ever going to find housing? How am I ever going to afford housing? Um, we started working on goals and stability with her and um, she had the protection order to help with safety. That was the number one goal. She said, I really want to stay in Sanford. I have support for my family. They can't help me financially much, but they're there for me, and I need to have uh, access to my family in Sanford. And I want my children to have stability in the school that they're in. Um, so we, we listened to that goal. She wanted affordable housing where she wasn't going to get evicted and really fearful of uh, how that, what that would look like. She said, I really need to get my license and a car and a job. And of course, I need to figure out how to get a divorce. There's medical issues that were unmet, including dental for herself. And um, we worked with her with, because we knew we were gonna have an opening in our transitional housing program here in Sanford that we have. And she and the children are um, almost done the two-year program with us. And it's really amazing. She had her dental work done at Nassau and Health Clinic. Um, she got all the medical needs done at Nassau. Uh, the school system has been amazing, amazing um, support for her. Um, she um, got her driver's license. We have a program called Freedom Wheels where people uh, in our communities donate cars and she was able to get a car and Lita was able to trade that in for a better car as she got a job, a bigger car, because it was a small car to fit all of them, but they could fit. Um, and she now has um, a, a, a nicer car, a newer car. Uh, she's going to complete the program in February and will be leaving us uh, at a point, because she just got a new promotion, that it looks like she will no longer qualify for a voucher. And she's not afraid of that. She worked really hard to get to that point. And so um, she will, her income will bring her pass, even with a family of four and no child support. Um, she has worked hard. She worked through the whole pandemic 
um, and she never missed a beat. And she had the support from her family um, and from Caring Unlimited and her community. Um, and we're just really pleased to see that um, they are all doing so well. And um, she commutes to Portland to work for this job, but said, I'm not moving closer when we started talking about housing because my kids are not leaving the Sanford school system. And that says a lot for our school system because she's willing to commute and make that work. So I, I'd like to um, just share that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes. So there seems to be a common theme in all of our stories that we all work collaboratively together and that you'll hear bits and pieces of the shelter, Caring Unlimited, York County Community Action, including Mass on Health, how we all, the school system, how we all wrap ourselves around a holistic approach to solving this. And that's kind of the theme of this meeting, that together we, recovery is possible. Recovery from the housing crisis, recovery from mental health issues and substance use disorders. So we always kind of have to keep that, that mantra of recovery is possible. And that leads us to Colleen to tell a story. So I'm going to tell you the story of a subject who I have made up the name of John for. Um, John lives in our community. He's been a member of our community for about 10 years. Um, in the last couple months, patrol officers have responded to John's house for several 911 calls and there was never any finding. They couldn't figure out why, you know, John went up, I accidentally hit the button, something was going on. But our team realized that there's probably something else going on talking to him. They couldn't just hit the nail on the head, but they realized that there's something more going on with John that needed some follow-up. So they asked the next time that we had a chance, um, or John called in, if we could, the mental health unit respond down there to see if there's some other services we can offer John. So. Lo and behold, the next day, John calls us, and we as a unit respond down there. And after talking with John for quite a bit, we found out that John moved up to Maine to live with his uncle, where they shared a home together. John um, has multiple disabilities, and he is on Social Security income and makes roughly $800 a month to live off of. John lived with his uncle. They shared the bills. They took care of each other. John's uncle died. John's uncle left him the house, but there was a mortgage on the house. The mortgage was approximately $850, and it didn't include utilities or anything like that, leaving John, who makes $800 a month, out of luck. Furthermore, because of other issues involved, John could not have a roommate in his house, which he was searching for, but cannot have one in his house with certain restrictions. So we found out that John was calling 911, and what was going on is he was getting so depressed and so anxious and putting things off because John didn't know what to do. John was overwhelmed. Um, some of his disabilities make it difficult for him to work through all of these multiple systems um, and contact people and you know bills were piling up and piling up. So we were able to bring our clinicians in and they recognized some, some, some things that they can help him with and so as a team we contacted some of our local providers and were able to get in contact with the York County Community Action and after some discussion, we realized that John wasn't renting his house. He was paying a mortgage, but he would qualify for emergency rental assistance. And so currently, we're working with our community partners and with John to help him go through emergency rental assistance to help him stay in his home where he lives and where he has memories and where he has independence. And from this, he's allowing us to work with him and making recommendations and with further outreach for mental health services due to him being alone and depressed and other medical issues. So right now, John is housed and hopefully will stay housed for the interim. Anybody have any questions before we go on? Ann, go ahead. I had a quick question for, I think, Bonnie, is that right? Um, you, you referenced the two-year program. I'm not familiar with that, and maybe it's something that, I don't know if it, it's a good discussion point now or if at a future point you can share information just so I can be more familiar with that program. Sure, I do have that for later on. It's our transitional housing program, yes. Okay, do you wanna go on to the next? Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the, as uh, Diane was saying, uh, we all work and collaborate really well together. And <clears throat> so what we thought we'd do now is pass out a little bit of a diagram that uh, shows how we do some of that work together. And I think you all have this in your packet, but just so you have it in front of you as well. And I don't know if it's possible to share this with uh, anyone that happens to be there. It is. It's the magic of... <clears throat> 
I'll wait till this goes around. Great. So, um, so in the center of this diagram is the goal that we're all trying to achieve, which is that people have access to safe, affordable housing. Um, and in the green circle around it, then, um, are a lot of the issues that we just talk about that we uh, commonly see that are uh, barriers in, uh, to, affordable, to being in safe, affordable housing, and then strategies we're using to ensure that people can be in and remain in safe, affordable housing. So um, starting at around uh, 8 o'clock um, is new housing development then existing permanent affordable housing, maintaining that in the community. Um, prevention, this is a really important strategy. How do we make sure that folks that are in housing stay in housing? What can we do to do that? Then there's rental stability and foreclosure prevention. So Colleen was just talking about that. Um, what can we do that for folks that are struggling paying their rent um, or paying their mortgages to keep them in their homes? There's housing navigation and case management. So we all do some form of that um, in terms of um, uh, how do we work with individuals that may be housing insecure or homeless to try and find uh, a place for them to be. There's temporary and transitional housing. Um, and then there are also what many folks are experiencing who are homeless are struggles with substance use disorder and behavioral health uh, treatment. And then lastly, there's uh, the collaboration wedge here, which is really an underpinning of all of our work. So we wanted to put, uh, give you this diagram to give you a sense of what some of the uh, major strategies are. And then you can see the circle around that are the different agencies that are sitting here today. There are many, many other agencies that belong in that circle around us, uh, around the, the diagram um, that we are not listing here today. So what we're going to do is um, go around as agencies and talk a little bit about some of the programs that we run to give you a little more detail on that, um, and then place them in this diagram so you can get a sense of what the different work looks like. Uh, and I'm actually going to start uh, by talking about a new uh, strategy that we're implementing that's being supported by Maine State Housing Authority. Um, and so about a year ago, uh, Maine State Housing um, and the State Homeless Council uh, did a review of our current uh, homeless intervention strategies in the state, um, and they put out a report um, with a homeless system redesign. And one of their primary strategy was focused on increasing collaboration. And so what they've developed is a series of homeless service hubs um, in different areas of the state. So we have one here, one of the uh, regions of the uh, is uh, Region 1, which is your county. Um, and so in each of those regions, uh, the goal of these uh, hubs is to increase collaboration. They're just getting off the ground, but when they're up and working really well, what they're envisioning is that the frontline outreach workers in each of those regions will come together and will be able to sit down and have in front of them literally by name lists of all the folks in the county or the region or the community that who are homeless and work through that list and say, okay, where, where's Carter friend? We all know Carter because we're all working with him. Where is he now? Who's, who's working with him? Where is he is on his pathway to finding safe, affordable housing? Um, and let's make sure that we've got the right strategies and supports in place to do that. Um, so that is, a, it's, I think it's a really important strategy. What I think you're already seeing is that we already actually do that pretty well in York County. Um, so this is really not new for us, but I think this is going to let us build stronger and deeper systems to do that, and particularly, I think, help us use uh, data even in a better way to do that. Um, and so, uh, uh, actually, uh, Toby Simon, who is uh, sitting right there and waving to you all, she is our homeless uh, service hub coordinator, um, and so we're probably about three or four months into this um, and are just getting this up and running. Um, but as I say, I think um, uh, one of the things that's worked well for us, um, and, I, and maybe not so well in other parts of the state, is that um, our staff already know each other really well. Um, all of us around this table know, we re know each other really well. So we really come to the table and have really moved to action quickly. So what we'd like to do now is go around, actually I'd happy to take any questions about the hub, um, and then what we're also gonna do is go around as agencies and talk a little bit about our services and, and place them in the different, uh, in the different strategies in, in this circle diagram. Um, questions only, no comments, okay, please, just questions. So I, I'd like to know, um, you know, uh, what plan, you know, do you guys have that are helping to work with veterans? Any, if you can share that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks can uh, chime in specifically about that. I can tell you, your county community action, we have several different strategies that are focused on vet veterans. So we have outreach workers um, who are similar to Steve was describing, who really are the folks who um, work in the community and are 
and are, uh, understand community resources and are helping individuals address needs in the community. So they're targeted also specifically on veterans. Our transportation program has a, foc a service focused on veterans. Um, so that's an important population uh, for us, and we realize that their needs are unique, um, and so our strategies to address them can be different as well. So can I just say that you, homeless veterans are included in that group of unhoused people that we're talking about that the hub will address? It, it is, and in fact, um, what a lot of hubs have actually started with that group of folks as homeless veterans as a, as a place to start. And so we as a hub have not made that decision yet, but there certainly is a group we're taking a close look at. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just go on to how you, whoever's next. Colleen, did you want to start? Um, yeah, so uh, we at the Sanford Police Department, we have little pieces of a couple different wedges. Um, first and foremost, um, substance use disorder and behavioral health treatment. Um, a lot of our officers are trained to recognize certain um, use disorders and behavioral health and to direct them. But also with the mental health unit, we now have a mental health clinician and um, an options clinician focusing on drug and alcohol counseling. And they're free, so they are low barrier. If we meet somebody out on the street, we can offer these services. And they can offer care in the interim while they're getting people into more intensive care or into services and help with some case management. So we can really get that wraparound service for people, especially while they're in limbo or waiting to get their appointments. Um, we're also, um, we also all do a little bit of case management, um, you know, together, whether it be homelessness, crisis, mentally, um, mental illnesses, or things like that. We work on collaborating together for some case management. Um, something as simple as getting somebody an ID or a death certificate right now is the barrier for somebody's housing. Um, so things like that, just finding out what is the small barriers and making those hurdles. Um, the other thing we do really great because we have all these great people right around us, and we try to divert people into the services that fit them best. So if somebody needs substance use counseling, or if they need mental health services, or if they need um, housing, or multiple different things, we can hit it from different approaches, get the team, you know, contact all of our contacts, and try to get people where they need. We will transport people if they are ready for something. We will help transport them, because that's a huge barrier. Um, I know the York County Community Action has called us before and said, hey, we got someone to house but they can't get there, and we're like, yep, we'll, we'll bring them down there um, to try to get them off the streets and somewhere safe and secure where they can be. I think that's our three. Can I just ask a question about, because this is relatively new, mm -hmm. this type of policing. Correct. So, um, and, and I guess I'd really like to hear from the other um, panelists, because you know that's, a, that's an investment that a community makes mm -hmm. and a decision that we make, so I guess I would like to know that as a police officer and as everybody that's trying to help people, is it, has it been as successful as we hoped it would be in terms of, as a, like diverting, we're, we're, because I think officers used to be able to go and be dealing with issues who, mm -hmm. the issue wasn't the issue, it was we needed mental health mm -hmm. treatment or we needed substance use disorder treatment or, or just simply help me stay in my house or whatever. So I'm just, I just, just like for the community to know that what we're doing mm -hmm. is effective because it is an investment by our community. It, no, it definitely is. I, I don't have hard numbers on all the things we do, but I did, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, recently between January 1st, and I think it was June 1st, we had six individuals. Some of them were incarcerated during that period, but those six individuals were responsible for over 500 calls for service over 50 arrests, um, 40 hospitalizations within a six month period. Um, by the end of the summer, all of those people have been placed somewhere um, or directed to the services that they needed um, and were no longer contacting us and are still continuing not to contact us. So those numbers alone show me that we are doing good um, and we are making progress. It is a long road. Um, you know, we don't have a magic wand and says, you know, bippy boppity boop, you're all set. Um, sometimes it's multiple attempts. It's trying multiple agencies. It's multiple different people. Sometimes I'm not the person that you want to work with. Sometimes my clinician is the person that's going to solve all your problems. Sometimes there is no solution, and we have to get really super creative and start digging around for other things. So we as a unit are really good cohesively and are able to take multiple different parts and angles and look at it kind of like Carter was saying, in a different light. Uh, we're able to work with the district attorney's office to try to divert people from the jail system and into recovery or other, other things, mental health needs, if that's what the underlying causes of the behaviors. Um, we're also able to outreach with other people and make some, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but we're able to divert people into other programs to help 
alleviate the burden not of the police department but off the community and the hospitals and the jails and that's really kind of the outcome of this um, hopefully by the end of the year we'll have some more numbers for you but it's still early and our team just got complete you know, about a week and a half ago so we're still working on doing some more good things so and I can speak from the shelter's perspective that the mental health unit with the Sanford Police Department has been a complete game changer with um, how we are interacting with both tenants in the community to prevent eviction. Um, we are in constant contact with the mental health unit um, working on diversionary tactics. And then just the relationship with the Sanford Police Department and being the relationship to our clients and the residents at the shelter being a positive, helpful relationship. There's not this fear, <coughs> I mean, sometimes, well, yeah, not this fear with um, running from a police car when it pulls into our parking lot. There's a there's a bond there, and you know these. Colleen and the entire mental health unit team, they're going, you know, into the woods and taking care of people. You know, they're meeting folks where they're at. Um, and I think the fact that the city of Sanford invested in this unit ahead of so many others that did it really speaks to how we are all sitting around this table. They really do enable us to reach people that we would have never been able to reach without Colleen and the entire mental health unit staff. And I can't add anything to what Megan just said so well, but I just want another agency to chime in and say yes, ditto. Because, thank you. Um, see, collaborating. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's um, one of those things where somebody might be experiencing or about to be evicted or has an issue with their home, and we won't know about that because people do have, it's hard to ask for help. It's a brave thing to do, but it's really hard to say that, yep, I'm going to lose my home, or I can't, I get an eviction notice, and I have 30 days to find something, and I don't have $2,000 a month to pay for a rent in an area that I, you shouldn't have to pay that much. So, but they do hear from them. The fire department and the police department hear from them, specifically the mental health unit. So then they can reach out to all of us, and then we can do that wraparound services again and do the best we can to find them. It's not always the, the success that we want, um, but it's always, you know, we always try to do as much as we can to divert that situation, prevent it, or um, move on to the next solution for them. So thank you, Steve. Go ahead. If, if I could comment on the, the success of the mental health unit. So I'm, I'm going to call it a, a four-year evolution at this point in time. It's been, been about four years. Uh, yeah. So when, when uh, then Officer Small really, you know, we, we, we assigned him to fix it. You have no resources, just go fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the typical task. But what, what, I wanna, wanna, what I wanna get at is, I can remember Eric Small saying, Officer Small saying to me way back when he first started on going out and starting to first meet the homeless population that was out in the woods and, and getting to know them and uh, knowing them as an individual and putting their attributes down and such and that, and we started having conversations around the table uh, and I was amazed that people knew, they knew all of the, the players, right? Uh, because they had tried to, to help them before and they many times had refused services and such like that. So first I saw, I saw a missing link appear, right? That, that contact out in the field uh, with, the, with the worst cases, people that had been out and been homeless for a period of time. And I can remember Eric saying back then, I want to get to the point of being more proactive instead of reactive, to go from not addressing the people that, are, that have become homeless for all of the various reasons that we're talking about, and many of this is mental health and, and drug addiction as opposed to the, the financial piece, but I want to get to it before it happens. So I'm seeing that now. So they've, they've gone from that, you know, being proactive out in the field, and the success for that is the partnership with the people that are sitting around the table because there was available resources there. We had to make the connections and the links and, and get that well coordinated. And I think the mental health unit has been a big, big part of that. Um, and then to address the recidivism. So, you know, you, you told the story for me that was a recidivism type of situation about John, the scenario that you used is, is addressing those continued, continuous contacts by the police department and or our ambulance department that are going to certain locations and addressing individuals that obviously they're going back there repetitively because prior to this, 
their, their needs hadn't been met. Right, so they're, they're doing an individual assessment. I think that's what I marvel about the, the city of Sanford is I've, I've always said we're, we're large enough to have the resources, but we're small enough to know the people that we're trying to serve, right? So they can make that individual assessment. They can make the connection. You've got the resources and the talent sitting around the table that the connections can be made. And I think the success, success stories have been tremendous out of that. So now they're, they're at that more proactive piece that I see now with, with the buildup of having you know, uh, one and a half uh, social workers as part of the mental health unit and two full-time officers in there uh, is going to allow us to be more proactive so we have fewer people that ultimately end out on the street. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, what's next? Or who's next, I should say. Next, Whose is. program is next? We have pieces of, I'll just kind of go around the pie um, and explain the different programs that we have. Um, I would put all of our food services. We have the largest food pantry in York County. Um, it's the old county building close to the jail. Um, that is open twice per week, Mondays and Fridays, 12 to 3 p.m. We distribute about 150 boxes of food each distribution day. That is, for us, our biggest prevention tool. Um, if we can help to feed a family so that they're not having to choose between paying their electric bill and buying food for their family that evening, that is one way to ensure that people can stay in their homes. So we continue to look at food services um, and providing meals um, through our mobile meals kitchen, which we hope to be a, have a home soon. Um, and the food pantry, we are looking at expanding those services to meet the evolving needs of the folks that we serve. We have an aging population coming to our food pantry, and so looking at access to food and how we get the food to the folks that we serve is one of our biggest priorities in the next year. Um, also under prevention, we are currently in the planning stages of launching a new program that would focus on landlord engagement partnering. We continue to partner with Sanford Housing Authority, but much like the model that Sanford Housing Authority has with, um, in terms of landlord engagement and, and trying to engage landlords ahead of any um, eviction process or people losing their homes, that would also fall under our diversion or prevention programs. Um, for the housing navigation and case management, um, very similar to all of the agencies at this table, um, we have a team of um, staff called housing navigators. So they will work with folks in the shelter um, and some outside of the shelter to find apartments, to apply for the housing vouchers, um, then to find apartments, to engage landlords, and really to take folks through the entire housing voucher process um, and gradu eventually graduate folks off of the vouchers. The story that I told earlier about Seth, that he would be a graduate of this program, no longer eligible for a voucher because he now makes too much money. Um, so that entire navigation team um, of the shelter staff would fall under housing navigation. And then on the case management side, we have a team of targeted case managers similar to um, the group that will work with the mental health unit from Sweetser, all of many of you know Lacey. Um, so very similar to what Lacey does, but with a focus on folks who are currently in the shelter system. So either at our adult shelter in Alfred, where we have 37 beds, or at the family shelter in Sanford, where we have 16 beds. Um, and these would be individual case managers that work with the individual clients or families on um, resolving whatever issues that individual may be facing. So um, that's a goal setting at, at the onset um, and then continuing to follow that person through um, and provide whatever support the individual may need. And then um, for substance use disorder and behavioral health treatment, we um, operate in a partnership with the County of York, the Layman Way Recovery Center. Um, it is a diversionary program. We work very closely with the district attorney. In COVID, we also began working with a lot of community partners. The arrests were not being made. 
Um, many of the jails were very limited with staff and the ability to bring anyone into the jail system. So we began working on diversion at that point and getting folks into treatment ahead of any backlogged court cases that they may be waiting on. Um, so we work collaboratively with everyone at this table um, to address the needs of the community through the Layman Way Recovery Center. Very closely related, we run a medication assisted treatment program. We have a full time staff person who is a psychiatrist that has worked with us for decades. She is the director of the Layman Way Recovery Program and our medication assisted, program, uh, assisted treatment program. Um, and our substance abuse outpatient program. So all of these clinical services sort of wrap around for um, post-treatment care for anyone who graduates from Layman Way and or anyone who has been at the shelter but is in need of these services and may not have gone through Layman Way. And then um, you've heard a lot about all of our collaboration <laughs> around this table. I won't continue to repeat all of the ways that we collaborate, but I think a lot of the stories that have been told around this table there are a lot of very late night or early morning phone calls and emails that go out when any one of us many of our cell phones are widely known through the community and um, if any one of us receives a call um, at least one other person at this table is getting that call to to team up and wrap services around the folks that we all collectively serve um, so I'm really, I'm really proud that our agency is part of this hub and part of this group that was already collaborating before we were told we had to. <laughs> and then for permanent affordable housing, um, we have about 400 tenants in the community throughout York County, um, over 100 housing units. Um, we continue to look at ways that we need to change our housing model to meet the evolving needs of the folks that we serve. Diane and I were talking about earlier, some of our single room occupancy housing worked 20 years ago, but the folks that we are serving now, it might not work. And how do we look at our housing portfolio and change that use to meet the evolving needs of the community? And that's something that we are all constantly talking about together. And with the cooperation from the city of Sanford, we have been able to address um, some of those changing needs as we've gone through this process. So that is sort of a high level overview of, um, of some of your county shelter programs, services. I'm happy to answer any specific questions. I know I kind of flew through that. We all have many of the same services and work together on all of this. So um, question. Yes. Now, uh, just going back to the food insecurity, do you know how many people are, are faced with that right now by chance? Food insecurity in Maine, we just looked at these numbers and I wish I would have brought them. Um, we broke down some Feeding America numbers. Um, I can circle, I don't want to quote the wrong number and we were buried in numbers all day today. Um, I'm happy to email it you can get that to back. all of you and I can break down even our numbers specifically for Sanford for all of you. That would we be great that, because yeah. I think that that is information that is really useful to us when we yes. see how great it is and how, and how close are we to coming to meet it. Yep, I'm happy yeah. to email you all that data. Thank you. Sorry that I didn't bring it with me. Thank you, and I had a question uh, related to your food services. With your location in Alfred, and obviously you're serving in a, a, a large area, but do you feel like there's a, bar a transportation barrier to accessing some of your, your distributions? I absolutely do, yes. Um, I think, you know, in we are on the internet, so this <laughs> will definitely go further than this room. But I think one of the things that we are looking at very seriously is finding a funding partner for some sort of a mobile food pantry <clears throat> and enabling us to get out and meet folks where they are at. That is something we've talked about for a number of years. It's something I think we need. We are the oldest state in the nation. Um, a majority of the folks coming to our um, meals kitchen and to the food pantry are eight, they're aging. You know, it's an older population, many on social security and fixed incomes. So accessing folks and ensuring that they're not having to drive to the food pantry in the winter, even when it's less safe to do so, is a priority for us. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll do uh, a little bit of the same thing and kind of go around the diagram. Um, so starting with prevention, so a lot of our programs, uh, we're a large multi-service organization, a lot of our programs are focused on helping folks make ends meet, right? So, and so folks that are struggling, stretching their dollars to be able to pay for rent, pay for food, um, to help them do that. And so we have a lot of programs in this area. Um, for example, uh, and a really good example this time of year is our heating assistance program. So this is the uh, Maine State Housing Authority. Um, we partner with them on providing heating assistance support for folks who are struggling paying their heating bills in the winter. Um, and, and if you're eligible for that program, you're also eligible for certain programs around home repair or weatherization. So there's a real set of programs that are really specifically designed to help folks stay in their homes warm, safe, and dry. Um, and, that's, and so that's a very prevention-oriented program to keep people where they are and let them stay there. Um, we have some programs that are focused on home ownership specifically. So we have home buyer ed programs and home owner ed programs, and those are designed, the home buyer programs are help designed for folks to understand what can work for them so that they get into a home ownership situation that's going to work for them long term. And then the home ownership programs are designed to do the same thing. How do I manage my budget to make sure I can stay in my home? So again, prevention oriented programs. Um, we also uh, uh, help uh, folks apply for benefit programs that they might be eligible for. Um, we do that in many different ways, literally filling out applications for them. But also we run um, something called our cash program, which includes a tax assistance uh, for folks who are filling out tax uh, applications and, and helping folks apply for things like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. Um, the earned income tax credit is the largest anti-poverty program in the country. The child tax credit, which only had a, a lifetime of about a year, reduced child poverty by upwards of 50%. So really important things for folks to apply on. So a lot of prevention-oriented programs. In the rental stability and foreclosure prevention um, area, we've been running, uh, as many folks know, um, since really the beginning of COVID, a rent relief program. And that's designed for, it's both helped uh, tenants and landlords uh, in cases where tenants have struggled to pay uh, their rent um, for any COVID-related reasons. And so that's been a really important program throughout the county. It's really helped out a lot of folks. Um, we also have a foreclosure prevention program, which is designed to do very much the same thing. I've already talked a little bit about um, some of the supports we have around housing navigation and case management, um, similar to what's already been described. And this is where our frontline staff work really well together um, in terms of uh, who's knocking on our door, who, um, what are their needs, which agency is best suited to meet those particular needs. Um, in terms of substance use disorder and behavioral health treatment, uh, so um, we uh, run Nassan Healthcare. So Nassan Healthcare is a local community health center. We provide primary medical care, behavioral health care, and dental care, um, and a range of substance use disorder related treatments. And so we serve a broad range of people, folks who are on private insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, um, folks who may be self-pay, we have a sliding fee scale so that, so that money is not a barrier to service. Um, and we serve a lot of folks who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, and uh, then in terms of, I won't talk, we've all spoken about collaboration, but I think that is the, a, bed bar, a bedrock of, of all of our work. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that as well. Maura, go ahead. So one of the programs I think has been really su successful is the Rent Stability Program. When does that end? Because I suspect that's like a cliff we're facing yeah. when some people can't get the support they need. It's a great quote, a question. So we don't know exactly when it ends. So it uh, was funded by the federal government as part of uh, COVID relief. There's and so, so it will end when the funding runs out. I think the projections are into early next year. So, um, but I don't think there's an exact date. And we've already started to think about um, how can we help folks. And we're, we are letting folks know of both when their benefits will end because it's there's a finite number of benefits you can receive under the program. Right, like 12 months. Uh, 12 months. It was 18 initially and is now 12. It's 12 months. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, so we, we prepare folks for the end of that individually and then also we're preparing folks for the end of the Well, I've the even, program. I mean, as a landlord, I've even, you know, pushed people that way when they're hitting like little bumps in the road. Yeah. And right. yeah, it's been a great program for, for helping with um, different family situations and now I'm like well, wh where do you turn to next because you know obviously the voucher program is a five-year wait and usually <laughs> it's a very <laughs> difficult tries, question but, yeah. yeah it's a very difficult question we're that we're grappling with there's a lot of folks who are getting help now who we know at some point are going to need more help in the future but it's is it possible though that this is one of the areas where the state may be able to supplement some of these programs in much the same way that we have still free breakfast and lunch which is now not part of the federal program. That is something that the state of Maine decided that that was important. So I'm just wondering if that's something that this group would um, 
I mean, there's a, they could supplement that program and make it, and if they had the, um, the, the, the money to do so. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that's possible. I can't. So that hasn't yeah. been anything that's been discussed by Main State Housing or hasn't. So nobody's really talking about what happens when it ends. I think a lot of people are talking about You're it. You're talking about um, that. I think, yeah, but I, I don't think that's a solution that okay. people are, are so, talking about. Okay, but the policymakers, I mean, I'm just curious, is it is it under discussion? It, it is very much on the policymakers' Okay, lines. because I would hate to see yeah. what Maura talked about is that yeah. cliff, and then all of a sudden all of these problems are exacerbated. Yeah. It's, and it's one of those programs, it's, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It doesn't have right. to be paying your whole rent. It could right. be, you know, you, know, you lose, use a formula similar to what Diane uses for vouchers or, you know, direct housing. It could be something that, you know, you can help as needed. But it would, yeah, it would be nice to have something continue that helps people at least get over bumps in the road in their life. So. One thing it has really done is highlighted the need. I think that this was a need that we all knew on the ground, but it's made it very visible for folks. So I think it really is on the minds of policymakers much more than it was beforehand. Go ahead. And I will say, I know Main State Housing Authority and um, policymakers at the state level are definitely keeping an eye on that cliff. Um, we were, um, we've been in talks about expanding a program that would focus directly on folks that would likely be discharged from these motels or from rental assistance and in need of, um, in of, in need of help in order to prevent them from coming into the shelter. So there, are, we've absolutely been in some of those conversations. I don't know exactly what the state level support will look like, but I do know that Maine State Housing Authority is absolutely keeping an eye on this situation and looking at how community providers can band together to support folks. Thank you. Um, questions? I don't see any. Let's go continue. I'm up. Um, so our goal in the school department is really to support students, but in supporting students, we also are supporting healthy families. And I spoke earlier about our outreach workers. Um, in the school department, we have two outreach workers. We have one that serves pre-K to four, and who's Leah Marks, and Cecilia Siriani, who serves grades five through 12. Um, so we have a referral system um, that is in place where referrals are made to our outreach workers, and our outreach workers screen for needs such as mental health, uh, food insecurity, housing, fuel, fuel and uh, medical or dental care. And so really, their role is to connect families to the resources to support the, the family system. Um, tons and tons of prevention work is done by these folks, and really, they prevent sometimes homelessness from happening. Um, they can connect the family to the, to the voucher. They can connect the family to the, to the fuel. The, um, some little things that really could make um, anyone um, experience homelessness. So there's a lot of that preventative work that's done. Um, and then there's that reactive um, in the moment um, support that they provide once a student has been identified as homeless. Um, as a school department, we all have an obligation um, to screen. If we, if we think um, a student or a family is experiencing homeless, to, to, to send their name down and we work through the screening process. Um, outreach, once a student and family has been identified as homeless, they will reach out and they'll assess the situation. They'll ask basic questions. Do you have food? Do you know where you're staying tonight? Um, they'll work through those situations to, to deal with the immediate and then they'll connect them to resources to re deal with the more long-term things. From an educational standpoint, we make continuity is really, continuity and stability is important for kids and families. And so we talk to the families about what is your intentions, what is your wishes in terms of educational programming. So if we have a student that, let's say, moves to, is homeless in Massabesic, but it's a Sanford student that has been with us, we arrange transportation to have that student remain with us here in Sanford. Um, we make sure that they have their basic supplies, um, backpack, clothing, sneakers. Um, we make sure that they have that stuff. If there's an athletic fee or a club fee, um, we make sure that those fees are covered for students as well. It used to be free uh, lunch and breakfast, making sure that that was paid for, but that's no longer an issue, no longer a barrier, which is great. Um, so it's really about, all about that continuity and support for, for students um, when they experience homelessness. Um, so that's basically, from a school department perspective, how we support students, it's through that outreach, doing that preventative work, but also once a student is identified, uh, making sure that we're providing continuity for them in their education. Anybody have any questions? Good. 
The, um, thank you. Okay. Do you want to take a minute to talk about the um, filling out the application for, um, for, the free for the free and reduced lunch? Oh, yeah. That's due September 30th. That might thank, be you. thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for reminding me of that. So part of um, funding for homeless um, youth families um, comes through grants. And they those grants are funded by our free and reduced lunch numbers in the, the city of Sanford. And so with the free and reduced lunch now being free for everybody, um, families have um, been less, um, hasn't been on their mind as much. But it's very important that everybody fills out the meal benefit application um, because that provides valuable funding for the school department. It provides intervention services and in reading and math. It provides summer school services for students and also the free um, breakfast and lunch that we offer during the summer that also is we're allowed to have that um, we're eligible because of that funding so it's very important that everybody fills out those meal benefit applications and there's also other benefits that are available to families when they fill that out um, the list goes on and on um, there's some that i don't even know about but so that's very important for the community and for families as well so I encourage everybody to fill out that application. So everybody, it doesn't everybody. matter, even if your yep. kid doesn't want to have hot lunch in school, they want to bring their lunch every day, you, we still ask you to fill it out because though that data is important. incredibly important. Yep. So can I ask a question on that? You can access it if you go to www.sanford.org, the school department website, it pops up right there. I figure uh, you guys are better at that than the city sometimes. <laughs> I usually can find forms pretty easily, but my question is, so, one of the comments I've had from some parents is how protected in the, is the information that they're giving you because you're not the IRS, you're not the main state revenue, which has some obligation for protection of personal information. So how's that, like, is, is you filter, are you filtering through just basic staff and are they, they sharing personal financial information with some of your basic staff members? No, the, that, the information when those forms are filled out, the electronic forms go directly to the food service department and that's where that information remains. Okay. Are those forms that are filled out for the economic indicator forms, those get sent to our um, IT person who enters them. That's it. Um, See, okay, um, student Tyler's mom makes bank. No, you know, it's, this, it's on that form, kid. but I, as an administrator, I don't have access to that. Because there are some parents, and that's one of the biggest concerns I've heard, is I don't want them to know that's information, so. I mean, that, it gets, the form is entered, it goes to data entry, and then we don't see it in the school department. Teachers don't have access, even administrators, we don't have access okay. um, to that information, so it's. So it is confidential? Yes, yes. Uh, I th think I saw your hand for a question, Mike. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Steve, I just had a quick question. So, you know, we have the SRTC program, yep. right? So we have a lot of students that come in from the outside. Do, do we have a, a plan in place to assist those students if they're, you know, if we are identifying them for, you know, for troubles at home or continuity, as you, as you put it earlier? Yep, so, um, Sanford Regional Technical Center? Yeah. Yep, so every school district in, in uh, Southern Maine, we have um, someone in the district that is responsible for homeless students. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a situation where a family comes on the radar, there are supports that we wrap around to make sure that that family is getting the supports they need. Um, that's a re requirement in the law. And I, I'm speaking, every district has some type of support system or safety net. And if we experience something at SRTC, our school counseling department is reaching out to the other district, the sending district to say, hey, this is what's going on um, with that. We have good communication between school departments. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Anne, go ahead. And I might get in trouble. It's not quite a question, but I think, um, Steve, it, it, <laughs> yes. it's worth it. At the end, you say, isn't that so? <laughs> <laughs> I learned how I to do that a long that, time yeah. ago. Uh, I think it bears mentioning that the school department has been a collaborator with the Sanford Backpack Program, and we're one of the largest school pantries in the state of Maine with hundreds of thousands of tons of food, including fresh produce, going out to every school site in our community. And that's a huge, um, the, the school department's making that happen. Uh, it, Able to happen so it's worth mentioning isn't it <laughs> yes yes no I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it is a it's one of those things it takes one more thing off off families it provides them access to food healthy food and it's one less thing that families have to worry about and there's I can give you tons of examples of um, things that are happening in our community whether it be um, um, 
a couple of years ago, we had boots donated. We had winter boots and snow pants donated, like 500 or 600 pairs of boots mm. and snow pants. You know, those are expensive. And so that was one thing that was taken off the family's plates. Um, you know, at Christmas time, around the holiday season, there's, there's things that happen. So it's those little things that make a huge impact on our families. Um, and the school department is very grateful um, when we have those opportunities in front of us. So. And just one quick comment. I was, I had a friend whose son was using the Y camp program and he actually randomly asked the YMCA director of child services, who's another great asset in the community, you know, what are the things that kids don't have? What do you need? What do you need? We don't need anything for the program, he says, but it's surprising the number of children who don't have underwear and socks. Underwear and socks. And, you know, of course, I reached out to Wanda, a parent, because she does all the odds and ends. And I mentioned it to her, and she, she actually um, I gave, gave a donation through our company so that she could add that to her um, school bus pro, stuff the bus program. And I think some of it might have ended up within the school nurse's office and so. stuff like that. So you have all these little, you know, assets that parents, somehow it reaches someone, and that information gets to some other group. And, you know, there are lots of little groups that can help fill in the blanks. And I think we have a lot of that in our community. Could I, could I go back to the, the transportation piece? So as, as, as I work on the, the central programs and services funding and state advocacy and such under that, so, so tell us again. So I, I, um, I'm a student in a family in Sanford. Um, we come, become displaced. We move to Alfred, right? But I consider myself to be from Sanford. Is Alfred paying for the busing to come back? or is Sanford paying the busing to bring them back? Yep, that's a good question. So the first thing we ask ourselves is, do we have existing transportation that goes in between districts? So in that case, oftentimes, um, Massabesic may have a bus that's coming over here for SRTC, mm -hmm. so they just hop on that bus and they go back. That's just one example. Okay. Um, so we try to find existing transportation so we don't add any cost. If we run into a situation where we need to add an additional <coughs> run, whether it be a van, um, the districts, we have an ag agreement where we split the cost. And so they take half the cost, we take half the cost. In rare situations where um, we have a hard time with transportation, not that we have a hard time with transportation nowadays, um, but uh, <laughs> parents sometimes transport their kids and we reimburse them the mileage. Um, and the funds, We've been, as a school department, we have been using our federal funds to cover those costs um, through our title grants, and we have been able to cover the nut with that cost um, with that. And, and sometimes we go for a couple of months at a time where we really don't have a lot of additional cost, and, and then there are times when it's just, it adds up. Um, so it's really, a, you, it's hard to predict. Um, but we try to, you know, use our existing resources to, to not have a cost, but there are times when we have costs, and then we try to split them with the district um, when possible. Steve, do you so, think you could just um, reiterate the importance, though, of, of why we do this, and that it's otherwise we would have children moving from district to district because of their homelessness? So uh, It's education it's stability. It's about creating that stability for the student. But I think a bigger thing that... Um, is really important for everybody to think about is oftentimes when students move, the families move, the services fall apart. Their support systems fall apart. So it's really important to keep people connected to our community and wrap around them to provide those supports. Um, because when, when, when students move to town to town, they never get the supports they need. Um, so that's, I think that's a key point from the school department. It's about stability, uh, but I think it's stability for the uh, family in terms of providing those supports. Steve, you had something so, else? So I, it was the last series of points that you made that, that answered the question that I was looking for. So I, I always try to look for in, in medical reimbursement, uh, in social services provisions, it's about getting people to the, the appropriate level of care uh, at the right time, right? So I was, I was concerned that the money expended on transporting students back and forth could be spent in, in, in other areas to produce a better result. But I, I guess I'm hearing it's about losing that support system when they go from one community to another. We can pay for transportation or we can pay for intervention on the other end because um, the student has missed so many days of school. So we can call transportation prevention? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. When I think of prevention, um, I'm going to add our shelter services in that area because it prevents folks from staying 
in an unsafe home, living on the streets, in tents of cars. Um, so that prevention, our shelter keeps that piece together. We have an 18 bed shelter here in Sanford to cover York County. And when our shelter is full, if someone is unsafe, we can use motel arrangements to keep people safe. We do not leave anyone in an unsafe situation. A snapshot of that prevention last year was 173 folks came through our shelter and received housing navigating services to find out what would be next for their housing goals. That was 105 adults and 68 children. 65 families exited our shelter with permanent housing by using a voucher and getting into a home. Um, that included 58 children. Um, you see a glow about the kids. <laughs> 38 families exited to stay with friends and family members to find other types of housing for themselves. And two adults were unknown. Um, we do prevention with upper R funds from the federal government to help with one-time rent payment or a uh, mortgage payment. Sometimes that's what somebody might need just to get things taken care of. Um, through the main coalition to end domestic violence and private funds that came um, through COVID, uh, COVID had some really horrible things, but some benefits also. Um, <clears throat> there's a th program called Liberation Funds, and that can go up to 2,500 to help a survivor with um, some type of emergency need. So that has done some prevention. Diversion funds from main housing has also given us money to help pay for rent, to divert them from coming to shelter or mortgage one time to help out, to avoid eviction and entering shelter, or help them relocate, because sometimes they say, I, if I could get to New Jersey, I wouldn't have to come to your shelter. So those are some prevention um, ways that we've been able to work with uh, folks. We do case management with the housing navigating. So once they go in with main housing, um, they uh, have up to two years of supportive services with that. Um, that has been very, very successful to helping folks stay housed. Um, just because you have a voucher doesn't mean you're gonna be able to figure out how do I stay housed. There are other components that we help meet the unmet needs, including budgeting and other resources. So case management is very important and we, um, we really have a great connection with the folks that we do that. Case management and navigation work also is a connection with landlords. How do we house that many people in today's market in a year? How do we find, um, you know, 68 apartments in one year? We're a small agency. It's networking with landlords. It's building relationships with landlords. It's having those tough conversations when you need to have them. And your cell phone. Landlords have my number, and they call me. And um, if that's going to prevent a potential eviction or a situation, I'm OK with that. So uh, those are ways that we work towards our, our, our prevention and housing stability uh, plan. Um, I was asked earlier about our transitional housing program. Uh, we're very proud of our property at 965 Main Street here in Sanford. Um, there on that property is transitional apartments besides our main office space. We have um, two one-bedroom units, three three-bedroom units, and six two-bedroom units there. Um, currently, we have 11 adults and 18 children on site. Um, these units are project-based vouchered through the collaboration of Sanford Housing Authority um, and have been for over 18 years. Um, it's a great collaboration and a way to support um, housing for folks. Um, in addition to that, while they're there, they're working on their goals and they're working on a plan to exit into an apartment in the community. Um, folks living there, we use the McKinney Act, which we talked a little bit about, about transporting children. Some children stay in the Sanford School District while living there. Some may choose for the, because it's temporary housing and it's still considered homeless status. While they're in transitional, they may go, still want to go to Massa Basic, especially the high school age and middle school. It's harder for those kids to transition. We work with school districts consistently to help um, keep the children um, comfortable with and feeling safe with their school and their environment they were in. As well as the uh, 11 apartments there, transitional housing through OVW, um, 
grants allow us to pay for two women to uh, two families who are living um, these women and their children are living in the community one in Sanford and one in York and they can live for two years and with that grant we can subsidize the rent almost like a voucher um, so that helps them to stay in their communities if they that's where they wanted to stay they didn't have to become homeless prior to getting the help of a, a form of prevention um, so those are some ways that we provide uh, some ongoing support. Collaboration is huge. It's absolutely huge in the work that we do. We couldn't do this work without support and help from the, um, from the police department, the schools, um, your county shelters, your county community action. All of, we work together really well. And um, I think that's really important. Um, and um, main housing, Sanford housing, these housing authorities uh, work really hard to get vouchers. And with these vouchers, people can have affordable housing. And so um, that is one way that we partner. Uh, and we connect with, um, with folks that have substance use disorder and mental health. Um, you know, Maine, um, Maine has limited access to services, but yet right in our community, we have Nassau Health Clinic. How lucky we are to have them how lucky we are to have the professionals there uh, at the hands of a phone call away for somebody who's come into shelter. They cannot go back to their community and get, get, um, get what they need for medical treatment and don't really need the emergency room but need. And, and they're there for us and they, they support us. And um, I'm hoping somewhere along the line we find out how do we get new housing development, you know, because that piece of this wheel is, is really, um, is something that I think our hub team that we're part of will be looking and um, finding ways to grow because uh, this wheel is pretty robust and full, but that's an area that um, will probably be taking on more challenges and asking communities to be open and uh, to the idea of, of finding ways to be, have more housing in their communities um, because it's teamwork and Sanford is doing their part. Okay, that's everyone. That's everyone, okay. So I invite people in the audience if you ha have a question. We have, I figured we'd be here till eight o'clock. Um, I will, uh, Becky, go ahead and, and, and let, but if somebody wants to ask a question, you wanna stand over there as soon as we have asked these, you can ask a question of the panelists. Be happy to hear it. Go ahead, Becky. I have one comment and three questions. Uh, the first comment was, what I'm hearing from all of you is that you are also working on self-esteem and having the people be self-supporting. So I really appreciate that because many times by being do-gooders, we do wrong. And you guys are doing what's right. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing is if I have a student, and my past life was being a principal, so if I have a student tonight, they've come into my office, they have no place to go because of whatever's happening within the family, they're not allowed back in the house that night. Is there a program in place that you all could wrap around that student? Um, because I know that probably happens a lot, because it happened a lot 10 years ago. Um, so is, are there things in place for that student now? Currently, um, we are working on a committee actually meeting tomorrow, um, to talk about um, host families. So having a list of families we can work down if we run into that situation um, that we can contact and say, here's a situation, are we able to take this student in? Um, currently, what we do is oftentimes we're reaching out to staff members or people that we know informally in the community um, to, take, to take folks in. I think one of the um, great things about this community is there's a lot of caring um, adults out there um, that are willing to take kids in if this happens, um, but we're, we're looking to formalize that process um, as we speak. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. The uh, thinking of the self-esteem issue, um, one of the things I remembered as a principal, the kids didn't know what to do with a baked potato when it was on their lunch plate. And so I imagine within these homes that they're part of, if uh, as a school we would send baskets of food home, especially at Thanksgiving or Christmas. And we always had to be very careful that most of the products were already cooked. 
Um, are there programs into place to um, help people learn how to cook and how to cook efficiently? Um, you know, I keep thinking of when we would send a turkey home and half of the people didn't know how to cook a turkey and they didn't know there's so many creative ways to use leftovers. Um, so are there programs in place that would help with this? I can speak to that at Caring Unlimited. We do community dinners at the shelter and part of that is um, taking the opportunity to teach folks how to prepare meals and, and we kind of look at what maybe was given in the food pantry box and what do you do with rice and what do you do with, because we find out the kids like to eat rice but sometimes people are afraid to cook it, they don't know how to yeah. cook it. So we do spend time doing that um, and we do spend time with talking about food stamps and budgets and how to, how to supplement your food stamps. What does WIC have to offer that can help with SNAP and what foods can you buy and add to the food pantry box. Start with shopping at the food pantry box and then knowing how to prepare a meal and what to do. Uh, as well as in our transitional housing, we do that. We do a community meal once a month and um, that's prepared off site because we don't have a kitchen there. It's prepared at my house. And then we, we I bring it in and then the, the menu and the ingredients and what I paid for those, like at Shaw's or Hannaford, where did I go and buy them? So we do do some time with the women to help them to understand that, that piece. Thank you, I think that's very important. Yes. The other last question. And I think Megan had something that she oh, wanted. Oh, go ahead. Very similar in, in shelter, in the family shelter, and also somewhat in the adult shelter. COVID has made this a little more difficult recently. Um, we will do a lot of groups around what's available, what you could make um, with the ingredients at the food pantry. And then that is something that COVID sort of stymied our growth around um, getting into the community and holding canning lessons and cooking lessons with the box from the food pantry that week. We are looking forward to getting services like that online now that we are seeing some glimmer of light um, with COVID, but it's just been difficult to bring large groups together with the vulnerable population we serve. Thank you. And the last question might be for you, Steve. And um, years ago, we used to have, I think in several of the schools, clothing rooms where people could donate clothing. Um, and especially at the junior high, kids are very embarrassed about their clothing because that's when they first become aware that they could be different. Um, and so the, regularly we would send the kids to those clothing rooms to get some clothing um, so that they looked like all the other kids you know, at the junior high. Also we had, um, because sometimes the, if they went home with that clothing, the families would sell it. Um, so we did have the nurse sometimes wash their clothing in the daytime because we had washing machines and dryers there. So they could go back into the nurse and get into their regular clothing and then go home because they didn't want to face the consequence that they would face at home if they came home with different clothing. Um, so I don't know if, I mean, it's amazing what you have to do as a community to help children. Um, so I didn't know if stuff like that still has to exist. It exists in schools, yet, um, both at the middle school and the the high school and the elementary school, um, winter jackets, winter boots, like there's an ongoing, there's a closet there if, if you need something. Um, really, schools are places where we support, support yeah. kids and get them what they need. Mm -hmm. if so people if, could donate yeah. underwear and socks. I mean, yeah, we just yes, heard yes, that they, yeah. that might yeah. be, okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Diane, you had something. I did want to also mention that we have many churches in the area too yeah. that help with a lot of those items and uh, just to reach out or a phone call to, to one of those churches and they'd be, more than happy to help families as well. They do a lot for us. I didn't want to not mention that, their contribution to this too. Yeah, and I just want to mention that schools do a lot, but we also have community organizations that also provide a lot of services for our youth and families. And, and so um, sometimes we receive donations, but the donations aren't necessarily where the need is. And so I just caution folks um, with that. Yeah. Um, Colleen, you had your hand up. Yes, and so we at the Sanford Police Department, we've partnered with North Parish Church. They have a compassion closet. They allow us keypad entry into 24 hours a day. So when officers are coming in contact with people at two, three in the morning who don't have shoes or don't have 
clothing. Um, we keep some of that in our office so that, you know, the, the main stuff like jackets and stuff, but if someone needs boots or certain sizes, we'll utilize those closets and go into them to get specific needs for our community members so that someone's not, not wearing shoes in the middle of winter at 2 in the morning. Um, so we, we utilize that one. And we now all start donating our clothes there because we know it stays local, so. Did you finish with your questions? Yes, then I will go to Bob. Uh, so I've uh, been carefully listening here for an uh, hour and uh, 40 minutes, and uh, I'm hearing stories of an incredible safety net that we have here uh, in Sanford. And uh, so first of all, thank you for everything that you do to support this safety net for uh, the people in need uh, here in Sanford. Um, so my, my question is, um, how has the council, we've done a lot of work on, on safe housing uh, as, a, as a council, um, and this is your opinion, um, and how has that, that work uh, for the council helped in the work that you do uh, in supporting these, uh, these, these individuals? I mean, we, we've been focused for a number of years on uh, codes, codes enforcement, safe housing, uh, those, those kinds of things. So. Uh, I'm fishing around here, hoping that somebody will say it's been helpful. Uh, <laughs> but we, we want to hear the truth. On that. Yeah. And, and, and I also consider that some of the most important work that the council's done in the six years that, uh, that I've been here uh, on the council. So it's a toss up question. I can say it's been incredibly helpful. Um, historically, my dad um, was the, the founding director of York County Shelter Programs, and um, he has chuckled a few times just at how collaborative this has been and that I was even invited in here. Um, so, <laughs> so I will say that this collaboration, this being invited here, being part of this panel even, and the fact that we are all having this conversation shows the investment of time and resources that you all have made. And it makes a huge difference. It's, it can be lonely for all of these agencies, for all of our staff and COVID especially has been um, incredibly trying in social services. And um, the fact that we have had this support of the city council has been reassuring on some really dark days. Um, and the fact that we were even invited here speaks to how much you, you all care about these issues. So I just, I thank you for having us. Um, and would, I'm sure other it's certain, certainly our pleasure to have you here, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd love to add to that as well. So I think, um, you know, if we look at the, our goal around safe, affordable housing, so I right. think we all have a common agreement that safety is an extremely important part of right. that. Um, and I think another part of the work that uh, has been important and, and should be important going forward is what then happens to the families that are impacted by that. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure they have safe housing, and if they are forced to move out of their housing they're currently in, then can we get them to, to another place that's safe uh, in the community? Um, and so I think that that collaboration has been extremely important as well. Great. Um, yeah, I, go, go ahead. And I, I, think I have for, a few follow-ups For me, for the, for the Sanford Housing Authority, working with the city departments has been key. We have a very strong relationship. I can call Steve for advice, mentorship. Sometimes he might call me for that. <laughs> 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 but, you know, the Land Bank Commission has been really important to this community. I don't think people realize the work that it actually has done and the impact and the positive impact. It, it Sometimes um, it's hard to get facts out about it, but I would encourage people to watch Ian Housiel's Land Bank presentation that he gave to the City Council because I think it's really important to note the numbers. And um, the rental licensing program, is it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. And this, the Housing Authority works with codes daily because we do our own housing quality inspections, um, an initial inspection before someone moves in, and then an annual inspection. And we talk to each other all the time about those rental inspections and to make sure that people are safe or that if a landlord needs help, that we have a landlord incentive program, we can help with repairs. Here's some money. Fix, fix the unit. It's okay. No one's going to get evicted and no one's going to get in trouble. And to really work as a community to make our housing stock safe. Right. So it's a team approach and we all have a piece in that. Yeah. Um, but that, that particular policy and um, committee that got developed is crucial yeah. to the safety for our folks. So. 
Yeah, I mean, as, again, uh, listening, you, you hear a lot of overlap, right, which a lot of people could say there's a lot of redundancy. That could be a negative. Why do we have all these different pieces? Why don't we just have one piece? But the, the true fact of the matter is that collaboration actually turns that uh, overlap into a strength. Uh, and, uh, and I, I think that goes uh, on the municipal side as well as all, all the work that you're doing that, uh, that it's uh, strong. So uh, the, uh, the next question that I, that I have for you is what else can we do as a city council? What, uh, where, where do we head next? You know, I'm a counselor, so I have to ask these counseling <laughs> questions. Uh, any ideas on how we can make this better? How, how can the council maybe lead the way to make this better? I mean, I think if, you, if, if the question is what are the most important needs to meet, it's about constructing new units. So I think that that would be a good place to, to focus our energy. And, and um, you, you know, I think, everybody should know at this point, not just the people in this room, but uh, um, that, that economic development has been one of our um, foremost goals. And of course, with economic develop, development comes an increase uh, in housing. And we do have, I'm not sure in terms of confidentiality, which, uh, which pieces, I, I don't want to divulge anything that, uh, but we have several, I, <laughs> we have several uh, irons uh, in the fire in this community uh, that, uh, that will help uh, in, in that area. And I, I think these are, uh, I could say, uh, developments that are going to happen. They're not speculative at this point. They're, they're pretty far down the, down the road. Uh, so I, I think the, the focus on economic development uh, and investments by uh, contractors in our community are, are crucial uh, with this. And, and I, I definitely see this as something um, for the existing council that we're going, we're going to continue to, to, drive that, uh, to drive that home. Uh, yeah. I think that's a critical piece that you bring up, Bob, is that economic development is important for housing because if we can drive wa wages up, then it's going to hopefully stabilize some of the rent right. issues too. So it, it all works hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And workforce housing is important. We talk about the continuum of housing all the time. There's a place for that. We need it. We need to move people along in that continuum. So I think that whatever we can do to bring more businesses in and right. market rent housing is as important as affordable housing. Well, it should be affordable. It all should be affordable. It all should be affordable. That's right. right. Yeah. right. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's that continuum. So really focusing in on, on that is key. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's, it's kind of a, the uh, rising tide lifts all boats, right? So uh, as the Sanford economy continues to improve, um, then that, that will continue to help uh, some of the issues that, uh, that we all face in, in, in terms, of, uh, terms of housing. Um, and... Uh, just want to see if I get all my buzzwords here in. Uh, but anyways, I, I, think, I think that's it. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I think Maura has a question. What, what I was going to say is, uh, Steve, you can put me on that list that you're putting together for the host some list. place for students oh, to nice. go who if they don't have any place to spend the evening. So. Did you have a question? Just a follow-up question. You mentioned. Thank, thank you all. I, f I find new unit construction to be relatively open-ended because we've seen a lot of um, one or two bedroom projects come forward. How great is the need for three to four bedrooms right now? Because that we are not seeing that type of um, construction uh, formula coming from the ones we've been dealing with. So I, I'll speak to the need for one bedroom. And actually, it was an article in the New York Times on this on Sunday, which is that it, 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 it's interesting you say that, that there's a lot of permits coming from one and two bedroom uh, homes because that actually is where the gap typically is, is the affordable one bedroom or two bedroom home, the affordable starter home. Um, so I'm actually glad to hear that you're seeing, that we're seeing that kind of development. Um, but there is a particular need for, uh, for three and four bedrooms as well, mm -hmm. uh, just because of family size. Yeah, family housing, exactly. We have two families that have been at our family shelter for over a year because they cannot find um, three bedroom apartments that will accept the vouchers. So um, it is a commitment that we've made. You know, that is not ideal that uh, 
four of our very few beds um, have been occupied for over a year, but this is where the families are stable and we will keep them there until we find or build them <laughs> housing and are able to move them out of the shelter. So we definitely see a direct need um, within our family shelter, their you know, family composition, I would say, we generally need two, three, and four bedroom um, apartments. Well, and I, uh, Bob, to your question about um, the work that was done around the land bank and our rental licenses, I agree wholeheartedly with some of the comments about being so important um, and hopefully bringing up our housing stock and 100% and in support of all of that work that was done. But an unintended tertiary consequence that I saw as a community member when that was first rolled out was an increase in people that were displaced for various reasons, whether um, their properties weren't safe, and, and there's always that balance. Is it better to be displaced or in an unsafe house, right? You know, so that question. Um, but I think I also saw, as somebody volunteering in the community, people that were impacted negatively by landlords having to um, you know, bring their properties up to code, pay fees, and now I'm increasing my rent because of that. So everything that we do as a council, that weighs very heavily on me personally. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great program, it's necessary, um, I'm, I'm in support of it, but at least on the rollout, and maybe sometimes even currently, there are unintended negative consequences for some people. And that's just, I think, an important thing. Nobody said it, but, but I, I saw it as a community volunteer. <laughs> yeah, and I would agree that when it first came up and we were you know, going and have, telling people to leave because it wasn't safe for people to be in, that that was the unintended consequence. And I know that my agency got called a lot to help relocate people. And I think now what we have in place is that with the commission that we can talk about those properties. And um, Colleen and I had a discussion yesterday about that too. Like we all kind of connect with one another, like, oh, this is a property that could be Blackheart because it's not safe. So what are we going to do with the folks living there? Or it's a building that's already empty and there are folks living there. So where are those people going to go because it's not safe for them to be? So the, the response is more uh, proactive than reactive now. Yeah. It was a so, learning curve for sure. So uh, just a quick follow-up here. Okay, I because mean, so, I have other yeah, people that, yeah, and so, we're almost so, to the end. Okay. So, so Ian uh, mentioned that we were approaching 100% in apartment licensing uh, and he is trying, he's on the, but, he's got his hand to, up. to Ann's point, my, what I'm trying to ask is, is it getting better because now we're reaching that 100% of uh, licensing? I understand it stumbled or there were places that it didn't work perfectly, but, and you can let it, Ian answer that question I was if you want to. I pl planning to, do you mind, you had your hand up, I think. Did you have your hand up or was yeah, it Steve? Uh, on the overarching piece. But. Okay, so I'll let Ian, are you here? There he is, no face. I'm here. Uh, so I, I, um, I wanted to share the data with you. So we did do a, what was called a target, target market analysis um, back in 2019, uh, looking at um, the desired uh, composition of what was desired for housing in the Sanford market. So people moving into Sanford in the rental market and the homeowner market, what kind of housing were they looking for? So predominantly it was the detached housing um, and then you could parse it out into people were looking for a single occupancy uh, flat type housing and then there's a lot of other areas um, that you could get more nuanced and detailed into which kind of housing that people were looking for in Sanford. There's that. As far as uh, any stumbling blocks or anything like that when the program is put in place, I, 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 I don't think I agree. I, uh, we've had a steady pace of, unfortunately, condemnations. And, um, you know, moving out of the pandemic, I think, you know, that's been what we've had to deal with um, going into the pandemic is that steady pace of condemnations. So our task has really been with partnership with the Housing Authority and other agencies is to keep that, that pace steady um, unfortunately, um, the, the situation is you have a very old housing stock, just like the rest of Maine. Um, you have uh, very depreciated housing uh, quality. You know, maybe it's affordable, um, but it's not decent. Um, and um, making sure that, you know, there's a, there's a just 
we're bringing it all up, but the reality is is that there is a steady pace of properties that are unfit to live in, and um, they they need to find other um, accommodations on a temporary basis. Um, our job is to give ample notice uh, to make sure that there's time to adjust so that we can work with our partners, find other people places to live, so no one's taken by surprise, um, so that so that, so that adjust can adjustments can be made. Go ahead. And Ian, can um, you speak towards also that typically a lot of the houses that are coming off the market are ones that are owned by banks or being foreclosed on and no one's living in them currently? Isn't that true? So there's not many displaced people currently. Right. I mean, you know, the, they're, I'd say, um, you know, when we were I'd say most busy um, with our inspection cycles. Um, you know, we were um, in a steady state of um, someone being displaced, and we talked about it regularly as to how to limit that because we have limited supply of housing, and you want to make sure that we're not displacing um, on um, or, or displacing as as least as possible. I mean, that's the reality. Um, as far as the, the demolitions and the dangerous buildings, predominantly these are, um, these are unoccupied. I mean, it's uh, just a very few, um, very few pre properties that have been occupied um, that, have that have been under the dangerous building ordinance uh, and under the dangerous building um, order uh, through the city council. Um, and um, uh, predominantly the ones that um, we do target for demolition have been um, I'm preparing for next week and uh, noticing that some of these properties have been sitting vacant for 10 years at this point. Um, it's really uh, um, a corporate issue, um, a, a national issue, and a, and a, and a failure of um, federal regulation and state regulation that keeps these properties from being available for um, housing. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, any questions from the audience? Last chance, the mic is right there if you wanna speak or ask a question or a comment. I don't see anybody coming up. So anybody else here? Um, Steve, you had your hand up. I will let you speak last and then I will, well, Diane and I will close the meeting. Well, earlier, uh, you, <clears throat> I believe the question was raised, You know, what, what else can the city council do? I, I just wanna applaud the council for making the investments that they've made in our community. I think the the, uh, a starting investment in the land bank authority to to address you know housing safer fair housing there you go Ian I just I just <laughs> there it is safer fair housing you know to address the the inequities that some of the uh, uh, past landlords were were putting upon the community for the aged housing stock they were pulling the equity out and not making the improvements and and not not keeping uh, good housing in our community but aside uh, <clears throat> other investments. Um, City Council has, has invested heavily as of late in workforce housing as well, because we can't talk about economic development without workforce and some place for them to be housed, which makes available other housing in our community. So I applaud those investments as well. <clears throat> the significant investment in ramping up the mental health unit, I think is, is really, and I keep using the term missing link, right? But it was kind of the missing link that was out there to make those uh, connections in, in my earlier reference of being large enough to have the resources, but small enough to pay uh, attention to individuals. And I think by uh, drilling down on the individual's needs, be it students or um, uh, adults, that is the key component, is, is identifying what they need individually and having all of the partners that sit around this table provide pieces uh, that you know, we as a city can't provide, but we as a city with all of our partners absolutely are able to provide um, so I hope that the community realizes after this dialogue tonight that the you know things are being done to address home, homelessness and, and housing in the community that uh, it is a concerted and coordinated effort. Uh, so I hope they recognize that. Um, yeah, and, and I'll leave it at that. So thank, thank you. Thank you. And um, I, Diane, do you have anything that you wanted to add before we close out? Or no. Yeah, I just want to really thank everybody. I want to thank you for all the work that you do. And we, are, we wanted you to be here so that you could understand that we want to be your partner. And we care about 
the same way that you do, we care about people in our community and we're gonna do everything that we can to make sure that they have the housing that they need and engage all the partners in that. So thank you all for being here and taking your time because I know that it, it's the evening that none of us are usually here on. So I, I, I thank the council for, um, for attending and I look forward to um, having these kinds of workshops. We, it's not a one of, we need to do this every year, touch base, figure out what we're doing well, what, we're, what we can do better and how we can work together more cooperatively. And, and thank you and thank the school department in particular, Steve, I know that for you particularly, this is just another night of meetings that you've had. So <laughs> I appreciate that you got the short stick and had to come. <laughs> I know how it works. Anyway, thank you all very much for all your work and I'll declare us adjourned.